Welcome everyone to Design Conversations at the Jacobs Institute for Design Innovation at UC Berkeley. My name is Bjorn Hartman and I'm the faculty director here at the Institute. For the spring semester, we will continue our theme for whom by whom designs for belonging, where we consider accessibility, inclusion and justice as they pertain to today's debates on design and technology. This series aims to ask, how can today's designers work to promote alternative methodologies and ways of life? We investigate design's historical and contemporary exclusions and invite distinguished speakers to share how their work considers a future of belonging. I'd like to remind you that captioning is available for this talk and can be turned on in your interface. This presentation is being recorded and it will be available with captioning in the upcoming week. For any other access requests, please send us an email to laurenartis at berkeley.edu. Lauren, if you could put your email into the chat as well. Today, we're excited to welcome our first speaker for the spring semester, Dr. Bess Williamson from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you that there will be a Q&A with Bess immediately following the talk. We encourage you to ask questions as they come up throughout the discussion uh, and throughout the talk using the Q&A function. You can also upvote questions other attendees have asked there and submit your questions at any time during the talk. Professor Eric Paulus and I will trade off sharing your questions with Bess following the talk. Dr. Bess Williamson is a historian of design and material culture and associate professor of art history theory and criticism at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. She leads courses on modern design history, design and politics, material culture, and disability studies. Bess's work focuses on social and political concerns in design, ranging from environmental questions and labor to justice and disability. She has published numerous texts on design's history in relation to disability movements, and she's the author of the recently published book, Accessible America, a History of Disability and Design. In that book, Bess explores the history of design and its response to disability rights, beginning in 1945 to the present day. The book examines the concept of access and its emergence in design thinking of the time and the everyday impact design has on the lives of people with disabilities. Accessible America has received praise from the design world and disabilities justice advocates alike. One review called it an engaging history of accessible design that points the way to design as a tool for empowerment, critique, and self-expression that celebrates the diversity of human bodies. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bess Williamson. Uh, thanks so much, Bjorn, and thank you all um, out there in Zoom land who are joining us today. Uh, let me turn my screen on. Um, so uh, thank you so much. So uh, my, um, sorry, my, my Zoom toolbar just moved, so I got a little confused, but um, I just want to share also some notes um, or an outline of my talk in the, um, in the chat here. Um, for, for anyone's reference who prefers to follow along by text. Uh, thank you again, um, joining you here on your screen. Uh, I'm a white middle-aged woman with pink glasses sitting in a bedroom with a mirror and paintings behind me. Um, and on the screen here, a sepia toned long exposure action shot of an empty wheelchair swooshing across the page with my title today, uh, beyond inclusion to stability in life and design. I spend a lot of time thinking about access and inclusion in the design world. I'm recognizing that disability is not out there, but in here, which is to say in a pandemic, especially we're all aware that our bodies are vulnerable and illness and health are social and political. Um, this is not a story of an sort of anonymous population that's being served by, de by design, but instead an interchange and participation um, through which design has changed over the last uh, half century or so. Um, I ask us to proceed assuming a variety of lived experiences of disability in the virtual room that we're in together. 
Um, some may have uh, may identify as disabled with life histories of illness or born difference, whether it's cognitive, sensory, mental, or physical. Others may have relational connections to disability, such as family members and loved ones. Um, disability is among the most common human experiences, um, and although its meaning is highly variable in social and political circumstances. Um, so I I'll start the talk by thinking a little bit about kind of where we are, like what are we doing together here um, for this hour that we have together. Um, we, where we are is shaped by this global situation that we're in and um, as a result, the medium we're in destabilizes some of the expectations we might have had around academic performance and behavior, right? Which is just to say, this talk looks a lot different than it might have about exactly a year ago or before then, right? We're on Zoom, we're not in person. I haven't traveled to see you much as I would prefer to be in Berkeley than in Chicago at this particular moment. Um, nonetheless, you know, academics, uh, disabled people have often requested these forms of interaction of virtual participation, whether it's in school or work for many years and have often been denied. Right, so we are in, a, in effect living a, an accessible experience that we might not have been able to very recently. Um, and I posted here, uh, you know, to think of where we are, the, the logos of some of the common tools of video conferencing that I am using these days, whether it's Zoom, Google Meet, Skype, FaceTime, Microsoft, even new platforms like Twitch and Discord that were originally developed for gamers. These are in some ways all the same they sometimes feel kind of interchangeable, but they're also a little bit different. Um, we're in kind of unresolved situations of expectation when it comes to access around these tools, right? They're, they have varied social meanings. Um, some, are, some we associate more with personal, others with public, right? It's much different to give a, a talk on Zoom rather than um, suggest that I'm gonna talk to you by FaceTime, um, right? But from, an, from a standpoint of access in particular, there are subtle but very important uh, differences in the operations, the experiences of these tools. Almost all of them have changed in some way over the last year in terms of their capabilities of captioning, the different um, platforms that they're available on or different devices that they work on. Um, for us here in this talk, we have CART, uh, Communication Access Real-Time Transcription, um, which is a professionally licensed um, typist uh, who is contributing in real time. Um, so if you turn your captioning on, you'll see that live transcription happening. This is considered the standard of communication access, which is to say a legal standard. Um, but if you, you know, turn it on or if you are uh, habitually using them, you'll know that these tools have their own quirks and differences. The differences even in the, um, the typist can be quite significant. Um, there are some of you in the audience probably who have you been using captioning more often in during this time of remote communication? If so, you have probably started to develop your own preferences around captioning. For those who might have used, a, who, who may be ASL speakers, you may have some settings in which it's worth the bureaucratic hurdle of requesting and confirming that interpretation as opposed to captioning. Captioning too requires a lot of work of finding out where, when it's gonna be available, uh, finding out whether it's gonna be good or not, uh, sort of AI automatically generated as opposed to um, human operated, which tends to reduce a lot of the errors involved. Um, if you're not familiar with these tools, I encourage you to explore them. How would following along by text, whether through the document that I posted or through captioning, change your experience of this talk? Would you notice a shift in timing? the need for a slower pace um, and pauses between points uh, where the captioning um, catches up? Does it help to clarify certain aspects of public speaking or make them more difficult? Um, some of you, I, I wanna acknowledge, uh, you know, might be using other uh, tools as well. Um, you can use the chat as a form of crosstalk during my, my talk, which is a format that never existed in the formal kind of silent hush of an academic talk. Um, some may be using your own tools of, inter of uh, captioning or of transcription. Um, these are some of the tools, Ava, Otter, 
and web captioner, which um, allow for digital transcription. These are the kind of tools that are on the user end, so they don't become a visible form of the talk. So um, I like to sort of highlight that they may be in the room as well. Beyond these technological um, additions to our video uh, captioning format, um, we can also make access for ourselves and for others. So I'll, I'll follow some of the conventions of disability culture when it comes to accessibility in this talk. You'll hear me image describe, which is to say, briefly describe images that are on the screen, recognizing that we may not all be seeing the same thing and that the art and design world in particular tends to kind of uh, rely on visual experience as a primary form of, of communication that often doesn't get sort of translated. We can use text as well um, as spoken and visual language. Um, so I encourage you to use the chat, use the Q&A. Um, you can follow along and answer and, and speak to me further on Twitter um, on my, my username at best www. Um, in online talks of like this, we also have the advantage of opening ourselves for other access needs we may have, right? We have the advantage of listening to these talks in our own spaces. So I invite you to make your own access to my talk if that means um, sitting, standing, lying down while listening, uh, doing something else while you're listening. Um, realizing perhaps that this is not a good time for you to be listening to this talk. And so turning it off is another form perhaps of access for you. Um, you may also be watching this as a recording later in the future of my talk, um, which means you can adjust the sound, the speed, or any other settings that work for you. So having given that sense of sort of where we are now, um, I'll, I'll move to my talk, which does take place mostly in the past. Um, I'll describe some guiding themes in the last 50 to 75 years of making access, to think about access as a particular push a new concept in the design world that emerged approximately um, at the end of World War II, which is to say uh, making access for disabled people as a public concern rather than a private uh, burden or responsibility, right? It's not as if disability was invented in the mid 20th century, but it changed public meaning and particularly meaning for designers. Uh, my references here will mostly be to the US um, and to the physical world of products, uh, devices, and architecture, but I invite you to consider how these issues play out in your own practices and talk to me uh, and others about them. Um, you know, I, I start sort of with the core argument, assertion that design is built around norms, right? Uh, whether, you know, from Da Vinci's Vitruvian Man, which interpreted a uh, Renaissance, um, uh, sorry, re re interpreted ancient texts about um, architecture and relationship to the body to produce this kind of image of the universal man as an architectural object, as something that related to the built world around it. It um, creates a, a kind of human side to architecture, but it also raises the question of what is, you know, sort of the difference between a norm and an ideal. If we do not fit into this geometry as, as proposed, uh, we know that we're abnormal were a misfit to design as it becomes increasingly standardized in the modern periods. Um, many architects to skip uh, further, <laughs> to skip forward significantly to the 20th century, but many architects in um, sort of high form of modernism use the body as a basis of measurement as well, um, particularly in seeking out a standard approach to human needs and, and uh, considering space. So Le Corbusier, the, the French modernist architect, set out the idea of the modulor, a proposal for a new measurement system that would be outside, would you know, create a third uh, path to the imperial versus metric um, uh, sort of conflict. But he used what he imagined as a typical, which is to say male body as the building block for, that would be used for standardized housing and urban space. But even in this image or this dramatic kind of figure with its arm over his head outline with its center cut out, right? This, the navel center as being the center of space. Um, it itself, you know, suggests a, a kind of lyrical interpretation of the body rather than some rationalized standard. And indeed, Le Corbusier apparently based the modular uh, dimensions on a tall man who he admired in his office. So even in making the norm, he's kind of calling on the ideal. Um, 
in, in this time period in sort of the mid 20th century when uh, our worlds are increasingly becoming industrialized and there's this search for the standard. Disabled people are usually uh, not only, you know, sort of not recognized as part of the human world, but forced to the margins of design, uh, required to adapt or to be ushered away and institutionalized or eliminated from the, the landscape. Um, they really just sort of don't appear, right? So it's, it's difficult to find sort of artifacts of disability in this mid 20th century period. Instead, disabled people come from the margins in, right? Sort of pressure design, make their appearance known in a way that, that creates a kind of misfit between the architectural world as built and the reality of people's lives. Um, in the US, legal measures were a primary way of making this change. Um, as early as the 1960s, local codes started to require access. Um, and these remained very bare bones and scattered. But by the 1970s, they gained more familiarity and began to be codified into their own norms and standards. So in manuals like this one, a very kind of boring seeming, perhaps sort of brown um, cover of a, of a book and the illustrated handbook of the handicapped section of the North Carolina State Building Code. Right, hardly an avant-garde design um, artifact, but it's actually surprisingly interpretive. Um, it was written, it was illustrated by an architect named Ronald Mace, who himself was disabled. He um, had polio as a child uh, and used a wheelchair. And um, he is representing disability in this official way. He is basically interpreting very um, sort of simplified uh, code writing that doesn't include a lot of illustrations of sort of what does disability actually look like? What does it mean to follow these um, initial standards, which were things like the gradient of ramps, the width of doorways and so on. So even the, the cover tells us a little bit about this idea of sort of placing um, an angled surface on top of an existing step, right? That um, accessibility as it came into the design world was often a question of renovating, of remaking the existing world rather than sort of starting from, from nothing. Um, and uh, the book includes surprisingly sort of interpretive elements. So we have this cover, which includes the international symbol of access, a very sort of standardized representation, yet the inner cover. So when you turn the, the page, you see this swooshing wheelchair that I opened my talk with. Um, the intercut between um, sort of architectural drawings of curbs, of um, ramps and so on, Mace includes these more interpretive kind of black and white stop motion images that seem to suggest a presence for disabled people in the design world. So, you know, alongside definitions of disabled people through, you know, the space that they take up in, in, um, the, in the world, he includes images of these of um, people on the move, right? In this case, a woman, Mace's wife actually walking with arm crutches in other um, images of people being pulled up, um, curbs and steps in wheelchairs, sort of an artistic interpretation in a sense, but one that inserts the disabled person into architecture where they had not been planned for and are not imagined to exist. Um, <clears throat> these insertions seem in themselves to be a kind of rebuke of standards that don't include the disabled body, right? And they're a kind of confrontation with the slow pace of um, code-driven design change. Another key area and key sort of story of that confrontation is local to the Jacobs Institute in Berkeley. Um, Berkeley, as we know, was a site of tremendous political upheaval in the 1960s and 1970s, and that includes um, a story of disability rights um, and uh, of a disabled population who became actively engaged in redesigning the environment they lived in. So on this cover of a publication by the Center for Independent Living, a groundbreaking community-driven social service agency that's still in Berkeley. Um, we see these figures, two wheelchair users sort of being pushed up a curb um, with their two attendants. And on the very left of the, of the image, a man holding a white cane. So a, a blind participant in this group as well. This is a group of um, young people who through the Center for Independent Living charted out this, their city made um, recommendations to the city about where curbs should go, uh, designed the curbs themselves, pushed back, I think significantly against the notion that access would be made for them by another authority, which is to say architects, 
medical professionals, um, educators, um, uh, other government figures. Um, in this case, uh, this work that they um, put forward of sort of being in the city um, and agitating for their own rights was significant in a number of ways. Uh, first of all, from a design history standpoint, it led to the creation of the first contiguous wheelchair accessible streetscape in the world, right? That is to say, not curbs within a hospital campus or even a university campus, not required additions to, you know, sort of one federal building or courthouse, but widespread um, access that cut across, you know, different parts of the city. In this case, for those of you who know Berkeley, um, a couple of routes, one that cut from the university campus down Telegraph Avenue to the BART station a mile south of it, and um, a stretch of downtown Berkeley. So um, connecting in a lot of ways, home, school, transit, um, as a part of this vision of an independent life. Significantly also, this group represented a community-driven approach to design in which disabled people design, defined their own priorities not you know, relying on someone else's definition of what success would be or what ac access would be. So to get into this in a little bit of detail, um, the city of Berkeley built five blocks of wheelchair access in 1970. And this is a longer story that comes out of sort of a broader activist landscape. But the important thing to note is just, you know, for the first time there are 10 curb cuts, the first five blocks of Telegraph. So this is a dense neighborhood of coffee shops and bookstores and hangouts, it's this hip, spot of sort of the counterculture 1970s, also key spot for protests of the period. And the city renovates it in 1970 and includes these curb cuts. But the curb cut doesn't look quite like, well, it's really called a curb ramp at the time um, and because it's not really a cut as we know it today, but instead um, the, the quarter circle turn of the curb is just kind of flattened out, smushed into the crosswalk. So it goes directly um, the, the pathway angles directly into the, the crosswalk. And while the wheelchair using you know, population of Berkeley was definitely took note and, and had asked for these ramps, they also noted a design problem with them, which is that by flattening out in the curb, um, they eliminated any kind of sensed edge of the curb for blind pedestrians. So we'll think back to that image, right? Of a team of wheelchair users and a blind person sort of surveying the landscape. By noticing this design problem, they then you know, came back with their own um, design plan, which was a curb cut outside uh, of, the, of the crosswalk, a much sharper one. So here's a fuzzy black and white image, but that shows this sort of second generation of curb cuts in which this sharp curb is actually a little bit to the sides of the crosswalk. This represented for this population a compromise uh, that would allow for cross-disability cross access, right? Not just a, a crosswalk for a wheelchair user, but one for a variety um, of, of uh, participants. And now we have, you know, a, more commonly today, we see a kind of compromise here with like a bumpy uh, pad or surface um, at the curb, which itself creates its own access problems. Significantly as well, their redesign also came with a demand to the city to ask them for advice. And so uh, built into the city process uh, as early as the 1970s was a required charrette process in which the disabled community had to participate in any major um, new construction elements of Berkeley. Um, that said, you know, th this story itself you know, reveals to us that smoothing out the concrete, you know, isn't always smooth. It takes friction. It takes a pushback between community and, um, you know, the builders or the, the local authorities. And this is very much the feeling of access, right? Is one of, it often comes with conflict, right? It often comes with compromise. Designers have often not been open to the idea of access. Likewise, um, cities and businesses have often pushed back. And that's very much the theme of the, late 20th century and even today, right? We sort of hear of like, you know, when is access too much or is this a special interest that's demanding things from the government and so on. Um, but at the same time, there, there is a, a kind of emergence in um, the same time period, um, particularly in the area of product design toward a greater interest and sort of curiosity about disability um, and one that informs a uh, new approaches that have nothing to do with that kind of history of legal requirements. Uh, the Cuisinart food processor is perhaps a, a surprising
uh, object to see on the screen in relationship to this talk, right? Not something that we particularly associate with disability in any particular way. Um, but this, this product's, you know, clean white lines, the oversized plastic handle, the big type, and then in particular, its handles are these low flat paddles, very broad, just two simple buttons. And we know we can think of this in contrast to like a blender with a thousand teeny tiny buttons on it, right? Um, it was informed by work that the designer, uh, who was a professor at the Rhode Island School of Design, had done, he had done some research on um, manual impairment and visual impairment, and sort of absorbed those lessons into this design, not something that the company asked him to do. It was sort of part of an overall improvement of this new, you know, high performance um, food processor. Um, and in this, uh, this bit from Mark Harrison's um, papers, you know, he spells out what the benefits of this are on this um, ad for fresh and frozen fluffs, like a kind of some kind of fruity dessert that you can make in your Cuisinart. Um, but he, in, he hand writes in here some of the benefits. So large handle, large paddle-like controls, gross motion versus fine finger acuity, um, uh, letters on field of, um, uh, on um, dark field for maximum contrast, lettering on controls at angle of view when using products. So he spells it out sort of in notes, but in this artifact, this advertisement with its notes on them, we kind of see the contrast, right? The way that the Cuisinart was advertised, which is sort of as a, a confection, right? A beautiful, fun, you know, sort of for the adventurous chef of the 1980s, not something that's presented as having any relationship to disability. Um, and so, you know, suggesting a kind of seamlessness, right? That disability can be incorporated as a part of design change, uh, not necessarily out of the kind of conflict that produced street level access. Uh, perhaps better known than the Cuisinart story is the story of OXO Good Grips, but a similar kind of storyline where two married designers, Betsy and Sam Farber, began to experiment with handles. Um, Betsy had, you know, come up with a lot of homemade changes and she had arthritis and had a hard time using, you know, standard, you know, doorknobs and standard kitchen tools. And so they developed this, you know, extra um, oversized rubber grip um, that produced a line of kitchen tools that's still in production, Oxo Good Grips, along with other tools that the company produces, right? But that incorporated um, a, an awareness of physical limitation into this product that's sort of seamlessly functional, right? Elegant, has a name OXO that can be read upside down and backwards, right? Has this rubber handle that seems to call out to you to sort of know how to grip it, right? That it will be, it will be secure under your hands. Um, and again, you know, the early advertisements for OXO Good Grips create, you know, pr present a similar kind of fun, you know, uh, stylish kitchen um, image to the Cuisinart, right? Um, but there's, you know, maybe a little bit of a subtle attention to the hand here, right? Photographs of both male and or masculine and feminine hands, um, even a hand with a Band-Aid that maybe suggests, you know, some sort of injury. Um, and, and taglines like gadgets you can grip are tools you can use, right, that suggest the problem of usability, even if they don't specifically call out to the idea of, you know, arthritis or manual impairment. Still, in the, the fine text here is the sentence, a universal design makes good grips easy for everyone to hold on to, right? So it's using a new term that sort of emerged in the 1980s and 1990s of the idea of universal design. The notion of a design that could address both disabled and non-disabled audiences in one seamless form. So whether it's in a product like this that works for a variety of hands, or you know, if we think architecturally of you know, incorporating uh, ramps into the front entrance of buildings or eliminating steps overall so that you don't have this sense of sort of two separate entrances, right? Or two separate designs. This um, concept of universal design, in fact, was coined by that same architect, Ron Mace, who I mentioned, you know, produced these sort of illustrated forms of the early codes around accessibility. And here's another image where Mace, along with some of his collaborators, sort of picture what universal design looks like, right? That it looks like a lever handle that is easier to, to open if you're carrying a bunch of packages, right? It looks like a closet installation that, 
um, in which the pieces can easily be rearranged for a child as they grow up or for people of different heights or for wheelchair users as well as standing users and so on. So they produce a kind of language of um, multiple use, right, of diverse bodies, older and younger, right, male and female, um, as well as disabled and non-disabled. Um, and the notion of universal design, right, uh, does a lot to shift the conversation around disability. But we can also think of it as very much within the politics of disability rights, right? The conflicts that came up with the sort of tensions between community and government. In, you know, that universal design is sort of gaining um, traction just at the same time as the Americans with Disabilities Act, the landmark Civil Rights Act of 1990 is, is passed, which, um, by today's political standards is a, you know, a shockingly bipartisan effort, but not, didn't, didn't go through without any um, resistance. And in particular that the activist message, the, the compromise message around this act was often around sort of the notion of normalcy, of joining the mainstream. So ADAPT, the major um, disability rights organization puts out a bumper sticker at the time of the passage of the ADA. Um, that says to boldly go where everyone else has gone before, right? A sort of play on the Star Trek tagline. But, you know, its argument itself is somewhat of a normalizing argument, right? This is not a radical message, but a message of going where everyone else already is, right? So if we consider this from a design standpoint, right, that it sort of fits into the universal design kind of notion of, of inclusion, right? Um, of seamless inclusion without necessarily sort of directly addressing what is at the root of um, misfit when it comes to design. These conflicts or this, these sort of tensions between um, what, what I might call, you know, sort of an, an accessible approach as opposed to sort of a normalizing approach um, still echo with us. Uh, just a couple of years ago, um, the top sort of architectural design firm Stephen Hole Associates unveiled a 10-year, $40 million public library project in, in um, Queens, New York. You know, this interesting, striking concrete block with these cutout windows in it. And it was hailed as this great contribution to new civic architecture until, you know, a few weeks after it had been opened, um, a few articles started to point out that there were some access shortfalls in this. Well, um, shortfalls uh, perhaps is one word for it, but we can think this um, building, those cutout windows are very much organized around a stair interior. So the those cutout windows um, fall alongside a, a staircase that goes into a section of books, the fiction section, where there is no other form of access to these shelves. So um, the, the architects had this idea of sort of, you know, wandering up the steps, browsing in the fiction shelves. And legally, this is, uh, ADA compliant space because there are other ways to get the these books you can order them you know at the desk um, but you know if we perhaps in some ways it charts the difference between 2010 when the project was originally planned and 2020 when it was originally when it was finally opened or sorry I think it was 2019 when it was finally opened which is that yes it creates a kind of access but uh, um, we might say it, it doesn't reflect a culture of sort of openness to various possibilities, um, right? Or sort of a full form um, in which the design truly reflects a notion of, of inclusion, right? Instead, it reflects a notion of compliance with sort of the bare minimum of the law. Um, the, the library brought up, I think to many, you know, what has happened since the, the passage of the ADA in, in 1990, right? Um, what great growth in architecture has occurred since then? There's so few really great buildings or great forms of design that we can point to as reflective of attention to disability, right? Perhaps the best ones we can look at in a universal design vein, right? Are ones in which disability is kind of seamlessly hidden, right? Not particularly pointed to or celebrated. Um, the rare examples are those that come out of disability focused communities like the Ed Roberts campus in Berkeley, the new newer home to the Center for Independent Living that used to be in a former um, Alfa Romeo dealership at the end of Telegraph Avenue that I think is condos now, uh, is now in this bold, beautiful communal building that puts together 
multiple disability related organizations um, focused you know, and, and uh, seated directly above the BART station at um, Ashby Avenue in Berkeley. This building is such a rare one in terms of having a central focused and highly visible feature that has to do with disability. It's bright red, um, large scale ramp, in, you know, visible through the glass windows from outside, right? The, the ramp is not only there and present, kind of calling back to various architectural greats, it's like the Guggenheim Museum, but it's, it's very generous, right? It, it accommodates multiple users. You can pass people in your wheelchair, right? You're not like the only person there. Um, it creates this gathering space in the center, um, as do other features in the building that kind of celebrate access, whether it's the natural light um, skylights, um, a, a water feature that creates sound, um, various air filtration systems to reduce um, the use of chemicals for sensitive populations, right? This becomes a kind of flagship um, enterprise, but it's worth asking, right? Why that level of access is virtually only known of in a building that is focused on the disability community, right? As opposed to being understood as a design goal for, for a general application. Um, and I would put the Ed Roberts campus into a sort of newer generation of design and architecture that focus on disability, not as a kind of functional problem, but as a cultural issue, um, a, a question of community um, in a very different you know, realm, but, but one that I think is, you know, shows the sort of expressiveness of a new form of design. Um, I look at the line of rebirth garments, a uh, um, Chicago-based fashion company that is, you know, highly flexible, customizable, brightly, colorful clothing for all genders, all sizes, um, for uh, all body shapes and, and requirements. And partly it's using its materials, right? Stretchy fabrics, um, uh, alterable patterns to be customizable um, within the realm, the sort of possibilities of a sort of Etsy level of small business. Um, this suggests a, a, to me sort of move away from the idea of a universal, but instead towards a highly distinctive, right? Everyone with their own very specific and very visible um, context. Uh, Rebirth has also, is also very responsive to kind of current issues, right? Producing this summer a face mask that has sort of every possible functional variation available, right? Not only, you know, a window possibility for um, lip reading, but also sort of every different strap combination possible from snaps to ear loops to elastic loops and um, over the head straps, you know, reflecting the, the varied needs of their population, as well as the concerns of, for example, those who might be putting masks on others. Um, they produced as part of this summer project, a, a special edition protester mask that was funded by the customized mask and was distributed through a trans youth center in the south side of Chicago, right? So sort of connecting also to current issues of the pandemic and protests around racial justice. Um, these varied examples, I think sort of bring us to the present, but, you know, hark back to the same core questions of sort of where we are, like where, you know, what is the ground, the existing built environment that we operate on, whether it has to do with digital platforms or materials um, or the built, buildings that we saw people responding to earlier, um, you know, what kinds of access um, can be made within them as truly a creative question, as well as a community based question. And then ultimately asking why, you know, what, what are the ideas of disability that are driving us? What kind of include, in, inclusive community are we looking for, right? One that is conscious and talking about disability or one that is just sort of seamlessly addressing the, the minimums of laws and standards. Um, so this brings me to the end of my talk and I'm, I'm eager to, to read your questions. I'll just put on, leave on the screen, sort of, this is like my recommended readings if for, for more thoughts on this um, from uh, two books that came before mine, um, Amy Hamry's Building Access and Elizabeth Guffey's Designing Disability that both address similar sort of stories of um, the built environment uh, activism and technological change. And then um, three more recent books, 
uh, Sarah Hendren's What Can a Body Do, which is a really great book, I think, especially for those of you who are in design practice that is written from a designer's perspective um, and addressing these issues in practice. Um, Jaipreet Verdi's Hearing Happiness, which is, addresses these issues in, in relationship to the history of hearing aids and hearing related treatments that I think sort of brings us into sort of the, per, the, the question of personal uh, adornment very deeply. And then um, Georgina Klieg's book, More Than Meets the Eye, I, I wanted to include partly because Georgina is a, a Berkeley um, professor, but also um, she, she talks very particularly about the way that vision interacts with sort of our worlds of creativity of art and design um, in a way that I think also fills, fills an important gap that, that um, in the literature. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'll shift now and, and uh, look, happy to hear of your questions um, and hear from you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Bess. Um, we will begin our Q&A now. So if you haven't already posted a question that's on your mind, please do so now in the Q&A functionality so others can see it and upload it as well. Eric and I will then take turns. And while you think about that question, and uh, start typing it. Um, let me maybe start with, with one question. Bess, I wonder if you could talk about the, the durability of advances in access, maybe outside of um, the law. I'm just thinking about the lifetime of the built environment means once access has been built, it stays for decades. In products, that Cuisinart processor is still being sold and the, the OXO good grips are also still being sold. Maybe it's easier to keep molds around once you've um, started that tooling, but there also seems to be this countervailing force of fashion and trends, which can make advances go away. And I'm specifically thinking about um, now the world of software where um, we just see fundamental changes in the technology platforms at a much faster pace and every time it seems to bring the danger with it that you know uh, battles that have been fought and won suddenly are forgotten and as you move from desktop software to mobile apps to VR apps access that existed suddenly disappears um, I would, I'd like to hear your your thoughts on that that's, that's such a great question. And I think one that that makes like the leap from sort of physical environment into digital environment really well, right? Because I think we're all sort of familiar with that, like the app that no longer works on your new operating system, right? That you really like needed, even if you were the only person who seemed to use it or something like that, right? The, the framework in the sort of um, uh, science, technology and society world that I have found really useful is thinking about maintenance as a a phenomenon as a concern in um, engineering and design, right? That there's been such a push. This is I'm borrowing from you know Lee Vinsel's work here, but the, there's been such a push for innovation, right? The idea that newness is always betterness, right? Um, in technology design, but the you know the realities of our lives are often much more bound up in sort of the slow time frame of technologies, right? The the houses that we just happen to live in or that we grew up in, or you know, or um, that one cane that you really love that the business went out of business, right? So we hear these stories co uh, so constantly I think, across the spectrum. So thinking about it from a design standpoint is like, how are things designed for maintenance, right? Or for longevity, um, for lasting. And I think there's, it's interesting how like the law fits into that, right? Because on the one hand, the law requires change to existing um, spaces. And that has often been the hardest area of architectural access, right? It's much easier to design from the ground up um, with access than to renovate, you know, thousands of years of human construction. Um, but the law does slow things down to some extent, right? In that sort of requiring a lasting value um, in architecture. And I think that's one of the, the things that, you know, legal change is like the least exciting form of design change, but in fact, it can have the greatest impact because it, firmly lodges certain values as like, you cannot build this building unless it fits, you know, and that becomes a, a standard that architects really absorb. So, um, so I'd say, yeah, so just to say, I think that, you know, the slowness, it becomes an important value when it comes to these considerations. And I think we can think about how like different design worlds embrace that more than others or where it's considered to be an important value 
Whereas others, it's like, well, screw people who don't have the right device to log into this website or whatever it is. Um, you know, I think that's often especially strong in the digital design world. Right. Thank you. Eric, do you want to um, start us off with the audience question? Great. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Great talk. Uh, I, I want to go to actually one of our previous speakers, Bryce uh, Johnson, actually asked a question. And I, I know you had this in your talk about universal design and I think that the question is, he asks, uh, can you give us your thoughts on the evolution of universal design and where you think it needs to go? Uh, when, where does universal design fall short? I mean, it has obviously some generalities that don't always apply to the specifics at hand, but it can be valuable. I'm curious, uh, I think, to hear your thoughts about that. You know, universal design is such a a fascinating history. And I, I should say, I've learned so much from Amy Hamry's writing here because they are very like deeply engaged in Mesa's original writing as well as sort of other thinkers of, of his time. Um, and I think it's always crucial to think, I always think, you know, the invention of universal design was both a like deep design philosophy and a kind of PR move, right? That it, I think Mesa was very aware that everyone had been practicing sort of an idea of universal design in the like accessible ex accessibility world, but they called it barrier-free architecture. And that just didn't sound interesting or exciting to the rest of their architectural world. So universal design is a, a name that helps a broader population understand like, why we're doing this, that it this is not just about like a small population, but about all, all users. The problem with that is when you, is first of all, you know, as the curb cut story in Berkeley shows, right? There is no design that's truly universal, right? Uh, I mean, truly, there are few things in the world that truly work for everyone. So the problem, I think, in particular, is when you know, the universal solution is prioritized because um, of a concern that designing for a small population is inherently sort of unimportant or infeasible, right? From like you know, whether it comes, you know, has to do with industrial tooling or just cost, right? That there's often this co this conversation like, well, why would we design for access? It's only 10% of the population, right? So we're not gonna, you know, it's just infeasible. So universal design is kind of a response for that, but the challenge is like when there are designs that truly are needed, but they're only needed by a small population, then like, th are they still justified? So I think ultimately you have to have a kind of ethical compact beneath the argument for universal design, which is that universal design isn't just because it's, most convenient for a broad population, right? But that, but because it's part of a broader conversation that challenges the idea that there is a norm or a majority in sort of any population. So, so sometimes universal design doesn't look like OXO good grips. Sometimes it actually looks like, you know, your, your phone that has like a thousand different options and you figure out which option works for you. So I think there's sort of some evolving conversation about that. Um, but I think is yeah important to think about how the language sometimes like can be misleading, um, perhaps. And uh, yeah, I, I'd say mainly it's just sort of you know different contexts call for different design solutions. And um, if the if the primary commitment is universality, it may be more problematic than if the primary primary commitment is to you know sort of equity or um, contribution from a community. Great, yeah, okay, thanks. And thanks, Bryce, for the question. Um, I'll hand it back to Bjorn um, now. Yeah, I have a question from an anonymous attendee that uh, actually goes back to the conversation we had before about architecture versus technology. This is a question, um, how do you feel about technology and accessibility within the built environment? So do you think um, technology, mobile apps, virtual eyes are an important complement to helping adapt to the built in my environment that wasn't made with accessibility in mind. So what is in, in your experience, what's your, your take on using additional technology to navigate uh, worlds with a disability when that world wasn't, um, doesn't yeah, so have access? What this, built what this in? makes me think of is like, um, you know, Google Maps a few years ago bought an app app that had been developed within disability communities to like, you know, layer in accessibility information, you know, so that you can, because the, the reality is, I mean, the reality is that the, the, the work of making one's own access is significant, right? It's like finding out, making sure, you know, looking on the 
the BART website to see which elevators are out of order. You know, the, there's a lot of maintenance work involved in in navigating the built environment. So, I, you know, I I would say those are the those are some of the best examples of kind of a cohesion of technology which can be rapidly updated, and the built environment which is harder to update and you know doesn't speak doesn't literally speak for itself, right? You can't know uh, until you get there whether the elevator is broken. Um, you know, it, it's it's interesting. I mean, it, it raises, I think, some of the questions also of sort of, um, uh, like, when do we do we design for the expectation of inclusion, right? So I think the challenge are things like when you when you put the burden on um, disabled users of a space or of a system, always to have to find out for themselves. So always have to have to request their access, like. You know, for the example, of this talk series, right, where we put on the website cart captioning is available, right, so you don't have to like email someone and ask them like is cart captioning, well, is it good captioning or will it be on the recording, you know, it's just on there, right, so I think some of it is, so I think, which is just to say, you know, of course, the technology is a great complement, so, uh, rapidly updated information technology is a great complement to the built environment, um, but I, I, I think we're also, you know, considering like what, where, where is the burden of access that it is best when it is access is a responsibility of, of the institutions that are making access rather than just putting it more heavily on the disabled users. So I think that's my kind of sense of it, but there's just such a, a flourishing, I think of creative approaches that are coming out of the disability community for communicating about these things or about with apps and with information about like how, you know, alt text as a form of creative work. I mean, there's, so yeah, I think there's a lot of exciting stuff going on in the digital world uh, in this area. Eric, should we maybe take one more question from the audience here? Sure, great, yeah. Um, so we have a question from Michelle Scott. Um, so obviously designers often uh, package their ideas in a storytelling format in order to best communicate why we should design inclusively. Do you have advice on sort of uh, sort of telling these kinds of stories or how to approach them it could be useful for designers and furthering um, inclusive designs? Oh, that's a, that's such a good question that uh, puts me very much in like that sort of 21st century uh, design storytelling. It's like communication kind of mode of thinking. Um, you know, I think one one of the things I just think about is like if, if storytelling is key to uh, making pitches for all kinds of design, then cultural competence, competency is very important, right? Because telling what's often other people's stories can really get us into um, just bad, non-inclusive, non-just in situations, right? So I think about how so many technology companies tell the story of accessibility through the lens of sort of tragedy or pity, right? Like, oh, we're, we were helping the disabled, right? Rather than through honestly, design standards, which is to say great performance, exciting experience, right? The, the pleasure and joy that design brings us. Um, and so I think some of it is like being sure that the stories that you tell are authentic, right? That they involve disabled people themselves, but that they also speak to like the heart of, of any institution. I mean, I, you know, we've all been doing a lot of work in the last year to ask our institutions to be inclusive, <laughs> um, you know, to, to roll out our various systems of remote work in a humane way, right? During like a global crisis of all kinds of different crises that are happening. Um, and I think for me, the best storytelling has been, you know, who are we? Like, are we dragging our feet to include our community members who like our caregivers or are sick or have gone through life tragedy? Or are we the best, most, you know, wonderful place to work and therefore we respond to it. So I guess that's sort of my storytelling approach is like to, through the, the lens of like our passion and what we really do um, and using other people's stories with caution, like realizing how much design has been done to disabled people and often in a way that hasn't incorporated kind of their authentic experiences or desires. Um, so I think that's maybe, yeah, that's why I would say, but that's a very provocative question. Great, yeah, no, thank you. And uh, I know we're, we're sort of running out of time, but I just wanna say thank you for the, the talk today and to people that haven't had a chance, please get a hold of her book. Uh, I jumped right in chapter four. It had a snazzy title, Berkeley, California. So that's where I started, <laughs> but yeah, uh, thank you. I'm gonna hand back to Bjorn. Uh, 
Yes, um, I'd like to thank you too, Bess, for spending your time with us today and to uh, all of you for attending and for asking these engaging questions. Um, if you'd like to listen back to this talk, it'll be available on our website in a few days once we've been um, once we've had the time to edit and finalize the the closed captioning. So thank you to everyone. Um, thanks and stay tuned for upcoming announcements for future design conversation talks. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.